Good morning, good evening, wherever you guys are all at. Uh, thank you for logging in for this uh, webinar. Uh, it is with great pleasure I introduce our speakers for today. Uh, today's webinar, my colleagues from Boston Children's Hospital, Dr. Catherine Miller and Dr. Anna Maria Baglieri. A little bit of introduction about each. Dr. Miller has been practicing at the Boston Children's Hospital for the past 22 years. Prior to that, she was at the New England Eye Institute and was teaching at the New England College of Optometry. And if I recollect right, she ran the Perkins Eye Clinic. Uh, prior, uh, she also holds an assistant professor in ophthalmology title at the Harvard Medical School. Her specialities are in pediatric infant contact lenses and pediatric low vision rehabilitation for the blind and the visually impaired. On the research side, she had studied the effects of optical correction on the functional vision of children with cerebral palsy, and she also participated in the infant treatment study, a fakia treatment study, a National Eye Institute sponsored study to compare the visual outcomes for children uh, with congenital cataracts. Uh, to me, she is one of the most, the finest clinicians I have ever seen in my life. Very dedicated, very hardworking, and most of all, extremely conscientious, which is very rare to find in this age. So, mm. thank you, Dr. Miller. Thank you. Thank you for the <laughs> wonderful introduction. <laughs> so, next we have Dr. Anna Maria Baglieri. Uh, she has been practicing at Boston Children's Hospital and Harvard Medical School for the past 12 years. Uh, prior to joining Boston Children's Hospital, she was an instructor at the New England Co College of Optometry, New England Eye Institute, uh, serving individuals with multidisciplinary disabilities and cared for patients at the Perkins School uh, for the Blind, Spalding Rehabilitation, Cardinal Cushing, and May Center School for the Brain Injury and Related Disorders. And I think I had a rotation with her at Spalding Rehabilitation Hospital, and I'm sure I left a lasting memory on her, <laughs> not from my intelligence, but by fainting at the clinic. Um, aside from that, her specialities are providing low vision evaluations and specialty contact lenses. And most of all, to me, she's one of the most beautiful human being I have ever seen. <laughs> Caring, total heart at whatever she does, and the empathy she has for her family, friends, colleagues, and patience is unparalleled. Sorry, I remember but that means yeah, no, thank, you. <laughs> thank you for so much for doing this. So without thank much you. ado, back to you guys. And I'm going to share the screen. Good morning, everyone. Um, today we're going to be um, speaking about pediatric low vision, the assessments and management um, for children with low vision. Okay, so um, during our, like for our low vision evaluations, we do, um, there's several components that we look at. So we look at visual acuities, we look at ocular motilities, refraction, um, visual fields, ocular health, basically what the entire eye exam entails, but then also we include into it a um, recommendations like for modifications in the classroom and then magnification. Uh, magnification recommend recommendations. <clears throat> Next. <laughs> um, so the chief complaint is one of the, um, is part of the eye exam and it's important. So many of our children, parents come in asking the main reason is for uh, like what accommodations they need in the classroom or what can my child see. Um, we do a thorough assessment of what what problems they they experience um, while they're learning in the classroom or at home. Um, we also review the associated findings, duration, frequency, such as like headaches, like how often do they get headaches at the end of the day, at the beginning of the day. Um, so this is an important component of the exam. So often we can, just by listening to the chief complaint, we can already figure out what what recommendations we can provide these children. <clears throat> um, so the history is also an important component of the exam. For instance, if you have a child with cerebral palsy, if their medical condition is C cerebral palsy, then we know, okay, it gives us clues to what to look for, such as like a visual field defect, strabismus, refractive error. Birth history is also important to know like what happened during the pregnancy. Um, <clears throat> or during, um, like, or after the, during the birth. So if the child was born premature, then we know to see what other 
uh, recommendations they may need, like if they need additional support with occupational therapy or, um, <clears throat> or to see developmental specialists at the hospital. Um, ocular history, of course, we want to know like if they, they're wearing glasses or had strabismus surgery. Family history is also important if there's any hereditary retinal conditions that we need to know about. If there's a sibling with also a similar condition. And then also social history. Um, we often ask if the child's on an individual educational plan, what grade they're in, if they participate in sports, and what accommodations could be included in, the, in this report. Next, thank you. Um, often um, during the exam, sometimes we have the TVIs or the orientation mobility instructor accompany the parents, the social worker, sometimes a, a personal um, nurse, or, and then sometimes the caseworker from the Mass Commission for the Blind um, accompanies the parents to the exam. And often they, they provide us the, um, often they're, they're there because they would like to know what accommodations they need and they often have frank questions that they can get immediately from the exam. And often during uh, the history, I often observe the child as they're walking down the hallway. I observe like their eye alignment, what they use for communication. Um, so these are some of the things that we do during the history taking. <clears throat> Next. So some of the main questions that we ask during the examination and history um, is like, what are the characteristics of the home, school environment, like how's the lighting, are this, how many stairs that they have to, um, like at the home or at school, if there's obstacles and they're um, like walking from, from a classroom to the bathroom, like if there's any travel concerns, um, what, what preferred reading material they, um, they use, Next, yep. Um, and what if they're provided any low vision devices, optical or non-optical. <clears throat> also, we request uh, a sample of their homework or classwork so that we can review what, like, what are the issues that the patient's encountering when they're doing their homework. For instance, in this page here, this sample here, it shows like it's just poor contrast. A lot of, um, many of the children have difficulty seeing the, the lines where to write the answers in or um, for instance, the numbers are too small for them to see, so they don't know which, uh, where on the page number five is. So um, these are things that we use. <clears throat> we review uh, occasionally, frequently the IEP and also methods of how they perform testing. Um, so now we get to the nitty gritty. We're checking the visual, uh, the examination. We start with checking visual cuties. There's various ways that we can check uh, visual acuities. Um, I often use the fine balloon chart. I like this test because it's quite dynamic. You can move it from five feet, ten feet, and you use numbers. You can use this for children children that are familiar with numbers. Then we also have our standard uh, vision chart, the MNS system that includes the ETDRS, Snellen, um, Leia symbols. It's and then also um, <clears throat> for some children that are not not able to identify letters or shapes, um, we, can, we can also do uh, functional vision using toys or food, such as Cheerios. Often, well, next, yeah. <laughs> uh, so often we have to do some modifications for many of our patients. So, you know, like if the child is nonverbal, we can do matching of the letters or the shapes or having them write the, the symbol on the on a piece of paper or signing the symbols or they do yes and no responses. Next. Um, other forms of visual acuity testing that we have is uh, the preferential looking acuity chart, the teller acuity. Normally we present this at either 38 centimeters or 55 centimeters away and um, it's a line grading acuity. So it starts with thicker stripes and then get finer and finer as they do the cards and improve with the vision. <clears throat> So, and then also we do the layer playing cards. What I love about this, the, the layer playing cards are the tiny ones in the bottom of uh, below the uh, layer. Yes, right there. Thank you, Parna. <laughs> so what's great about it is that, um, you know, you can play with the child, do a card game with them and they can match, m match with the symbols. And then 
Um, it's quite variable. You can be dynamic with the distance that you measure or the acuity, but this is a good tool to use. I also use the flip card. That's another great tool to use with, um, with measuring visual acuity with um, the pediatric population. <clears throat> Next. Other um, near acuity charts that we use is the popular lighthouse near acuity chart. Um, often I provide like a photocopy of what the recommended font once I figure out what their threshold acuity is. And then you use the continuous text reading card. I enjoy using this card for a lot of our um, <clears throat> patients that are that read. So what I do is I have them start reading from the larger font and then they when they when they start to read uh, the smaller print I start to observe like their fluency if it starts to slow down that tells me that's where they may have difficulties with the font size so then I often recommend like one or two lines above the threshold acuity. <clears throat> Next. Refraction. Refraction is an, another important piece to the uh, exam. It's important to correct the child to the best acuity that you can. Uh, it can impact uncorrected, uh, refractive error can impact their lifetime and affect education and employment. For instance, a child that's not uh, corrected for like high astigmatisms could impact and that may have nystagmus. For instance, a child with albinism, they, it may affect their um, ability to drive. So if you're not correcting them um, during their during the critical period, it may impact their um, visual outcomes. <clears throat> Contrast sensitivity is also another um, important tool that we use during our low vision evaluations. Um, often it helps determine the higher magnification levels, even when you have a, ch uh, a baseline acuity of 20, 25, 20, 30. So um, this is another tool that we use. <clears throat> Next. Color vision testing. Um, we often use the uh, either the Precision 16, this is the one that's on the um, photograph here. These are larger discs and they're easier to maneuver for the child. Um, and basically this is similar to a color matching. They have to line up the color that's closest to the previous um, color disc. Um, and then the Farnsworth D15 is 15 discs, but they're much smaller. Um, the HRR plates are a great tool to use for color vision testing because it um, tests both for red, green, and blue, yellow <laughs> defects. And then uh, Ishihara. Okay, so next. <laughs> so visual field testing, um, where we do perform in our clinic as well. So um, Dr. Miller and I often um, perform a Goldman visual field test on the children here, especially if we're suspecting a visual field defect. And then also we use a modified confrontational field by using certain toys. Um, while they're looking at a toy centrally, then the parent where we bring the toy up from behind. Um, Dr. Louisa Mayer has a, <clears throat> an arc perimeter at the Perkins School for the Blind that she uses to test visual fields for infants and toddlers. So um, unfortunately we, we used to have it at Children's, but now it's at Perkins. Um, but uh, when assessing the visual field, it helps determine how to place materials for the child and if they need the mobility support as well. Okay, mm -hmm. now I'm handing off the baton to Dr. Miller. It's my turn. Yeah, it's so your turn. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, uh, the types of devices that we select for uh, children. Um, a lot of the devices, as you probably know, were designed with adults in mind because most of the uh, uh, blindness and visual impairment in the world uh, is relegated to adults. But uh, we do find that some of these devices work beautifully in children. Um, I think the concept with children is to pick something simple uh, that they're cosmetically not going to be concerned with using. Um, most children are very concerned with what they look like and how they look different than other children. And I think for the most part, you want to select something that um, will work with the child and they'll be able to accept it without, um, without difficulty. Uh, so yeah. the first category of devices that we usually think in terms of providing to a child are, are something in the line of a high plus reading lens or a microscopic device. Now, um, the microscopic devices are the 
uh, second picture on the top on the right that they're very high plus powered lenses that are placed in a frame. And the power of these lenses can go anywhere up to about a plus 48 to plus 52, which is extremely high powered lens. Uh, because of the nature of the lens, uh, it provides magnification at the near point, but it requires that you hold the material at a, a very close range. So you're probably holding uh, material within a one, two, three inch working distance when you're using these high powered lenses. But they're mm -hmm. effective for children who um, you don't want to have hold something in their hand for a magnifier uh, because it's placed on the face. And they, it does allow them to hold materials very close, which most of them will do anyway if they have a significant vision loss. Cosmetics, however, is a big drawback with this device and uh, I find that I do use it, but on a very rare uh, instance will I prescribe these for kids. What I prescribe more commonly is the bifocal, which you, you see pictured on the uh, left picture, the little girl with the red glasses. Uh, if you mm -hmm. can place a high-powered bifocal in a pair of glasses, you will achieve a, a level of magnification for that child. Um, it does provide accommodative relief because most children do hold materials at a very close range. So giving them that extra power at the near point helps to, to reduce fatigue with reading. Uh, and it does allow them to hold materials at a closer viewing distance, which will increase your retinal image size, therefore increasing magnification. The goal with most of these devices is to um, get the child to read to a level of um, 1.0 m which is about 2050 print size and that's true of pretty much any device that you use um, the second category of devices that we use are uh, hand and stand magnifiers uh, a hand the, the beauty of all of these devices is they tend to be lightweight they're portable they're inexpensive um, they, they're cosmetically not totally unacceptable, but not the greatest from the standpoint of cosmetics, but um, we do find some children will use these. The intention of most of the uh, hand magnifiers, which is pictured in the top picture, uh, is to view things for short periods of time, like if you were looking at pictures or uh, maps or graphs or something that you did not want to read long term. And the reason for that is the hand magnifiers require that you hold them and focus them. And the focusing can create some physical fatigue for a child if, it's, um, if it has to be done on an extended basis. So we usually don't consider a hand magnifier as a reading device. It's meant more for short term um, spot reading uh, and something that you would uh, do on a short-term basis. The stand magnifiers, which are the two pictured in the lower pictures, are a fixed focus device. And uh, the benefit of these are that you do not have to focus them. You place them on the print and the magnification is incurred um, directly. Uh, so it does cut down on the fatigue factor. And we do find that some children will, will accept these. Next slide, please. So other stand magnifiers, um, these, are, these are kind of the favorite ones that I use with kids because these are simple, they're easy. Um, most kids look at them and they're not uh, offended by them and um, they'll use them. The dome magnifier, the, the round shaped ball is probably my most favorite and uh, most children will use this uh, without hesitation. It's a good reading device. Um, if you are not using technology. So uh, the, the advantage of this is obviously that it's portable. You can stick it in your pocket and take it with you. Uh, the levels of magnification are not high. Uh, somewhere between two and three and a half times magnification is what you're going to get with some of these simpler magnifiers. But uh, if you need a little bit of a boost for magnification, these are exceptional devices for children. Next slide, please. So um, distance activities, you are going to rely on the telescopic devices, which are pictured here. Uh, these devices range anywhere from two and a half to 10x uh, magnification. 
and they the majority of them are focusable so you can focus anywhere from 10 inches to optical infinity with these devices the intention of a, a handheld telescope generally is for mobility purposes so a lot of these children will use these uh, outdoors when they're working with the mobility specialists uh, to view street signs um, you know, street lights go to when they go to the zoo, they'll look be able to look at the animals. Uh, so they're meant for distance viewing. They are applicable for the classroom, although here again it's somewhat of a cosmetic factor. So they tend most kids tend not to use them in the classroom, but I certainly would encourage it because it's a simple device to just whip out and look you know, at what's going on on the blackboard or the whiteboard and then uh, put it back down again. So um, they are certainly beneficial in the classroom, but uh, more ap applicable for mobility purposes. Oh, uh, back up a minute, Aparna. The, um, a, a, an issue with telescopes is you have to keep in mind that a lot of your low vision children have nystagmus. Uh, when you put them behind a telescopic device, the nystagmus often increases. So you will see a, a, an, an instability in their ability to look through this device. So it may require some training for them to use it appropriately. But in some cases, you may find that the nystagmus is so significant that it precludes your ability to use this device. Uh, the other issue is light. Using a telescope, uh, inhibits some of the light that gets into the eye. It blocks light from getting to the retina. And that alone may also cause uh, difficulty with a child using this device. So uh, keep those two things in mind, the nystagmus and the decrease in light that may have a, a distinct effect on how successful you are with a telescopic device. Uh, the goal with the telescope usually I find this is kind of an internal goal. If I'm getting at least 2080 acuity, an improvement to 2080, um, it's going to be a device that's that's helpful. Uh, obviously, I shoot for better acuity. If I can get 2040, 2030, 2040 type acuity with a telescopic device, you you're uh, doing pretty well. So uh, you you do obviously check acuities through the devices to see which one would be the, the most appropriate device for them. Next slide. So <clears throat> most children nowadays use some form of uh, technology in the classroom and, and at home to do homework. And technology has been probably one of the biggest um, factors in making a curriculum accessible to a low vision child. Uh, and it's, it's nice to know that school systems now are much more willing to put this technology in place for kids uh, to help them succeed in the classroom. There's a lot of technology out there and how we determine which piece of technology is sometimes a different, difficult thing to do. Um, we usually leave that in the hands of the vision teachers, the teachers of the visually impaired who are in the classroom with the child and have a uh, uh, direct ability to um, assess them in using a device. And we also usually recommend that they undergo some type of a technology assessment uh, so that the appro most appropriate device can be selected for them. Um, there are, I'll show you a few video magnifiers in the next slides, but there are also computer programs that are successful for kids. Um, they may use Zoom Text, um, which is a program which enlarges print as well as has a readback feature uh, involved. Uh, JAWS, which is a, strictly a readback program. Uh, Kurzweil, which also enlarges and reads back. And certainly children that use, um, that are Braille readers, uh, they have uh, Braille and Speak, which will um, also use an auditory component for function. Next slide, please. So most of your video magnifiers have uh, some form of a camera involved. And the beauty of the camera is that it can be rotated to distance viewing. So you can rotate it for the child to see what's going on on the blackboard. Um, but you can also rotate it down onto the desk area so that you, they can 
uh, put a book under there or a paper that they have to complete um, and they can view targets at, at a near range. Uh, the cameras in some cases can also go 360 degrees around the room so it can be focused on, on any part of the room that the teacher may be uh, working so that the child can pick up the camera image directly on their uh, video screen which is sitting at their desk in the classroom. And there's a huge capacity for magnification here, up to 65 times magnification with most of these devices. I listed a few of the names down at the bottom there and, um, that are common video magnifiers. These are not the only ones on the market, and I'm certainly not saying that these are the only ones to be used, but these are some of the more common ones that we find our children have been using in the classrooms, and uh, they seem to be adapting well with with this type of uh, device. Some of these mm -hmm. devices um, are more portable than others. Some can be carried from one classroom to the next. Um, this is always an issue when the children get into the middle school or the high school because they switch classes from one place to the next. And carrying a big piece of uh, equipment with you to from one class to the other can be problematic. So. Um, some of these do collapse up into a smaller, more compact uh, bag that you can carry from one class to the next, but that is an issue and um, something to, to consider with the kids that you recommend these for. Next slide, please. Uh, I think you skipped back up one. Yes. So um, uh, these are other examples of video magnifiers. The top image is just showing that you can complete a, um, a written, or you can write on the video magnifier table while you're viewing it on the screen. Uh, in this case, they're doing a crossword puzzle. The bottom slide shows how the camera is projecting at a distance uh, board, whiteboard, and the images are coming up on the screen at the desk. Next slide. And uh, many children like the smaller portable video magnifiers, which are uh, demonstrated here. Uh, they don't offer as much magnification. You're getting uh, somewhere between four and nine times magnification. The other drawback is the uh, screen sizes are smaller. So there's not as obviously as much of a, a viewing area. Uh, and they rely on a uh, batteries, which generally last about three to four hours. Uh, but the beauty of these are their portability. And um, here again, I've listed a few of the common ones that children use uh, at the bottom of the uh, screen here, which, um, which have been uh, helpful. Next slide. Okay. I'll pass this over to Anna Maria. Okay, so I'm going to review some of the functions of the iPad. This is one of the more popular tools that we're using right now, um, like the children with low vision are using. Um, so what's great about the iPad, it has voiceover. There's some applications now that can read um, Braille to text, um, enlarging font. There's a Siri application that you can use. Um, dictation is also another function, and display adjustments. Often what they do is if the parent brings the iPad, I review the iPad with the parent. I, I go, in, go into the accessibility function and I look to see if I can make adjustments to the font for them and um, contrast and et cetera. Okay, so next. <clears throat> so here's a little lovely um, video about, about how this child uses an iPad. And she, she actually taught me a few things during this uh, evaluation. I think you'll enjoy it. Um, some of the really helpful features that we have on here is I have one thing. Um, I actually have two of them, but one I prefer more than the other. I have this app called Read to Go. So I have a hard time reading books with fairly small text. So um, I have this, and it really, really helps me out with that stuff because um, it reads it back to me. I have another one that does pretty much the same thing, except this one is called um, Voice Dream, which I prefer not to use as much because the voice is a lot more, um, a lot more just flat, 
but the one on read to go is actually has some expression. Then I have an app that I don't use as often, um, but it still is helpful. It's called Show Me. So what we originally got it for is to um, I can take a picture of something, and it's basically one of those like doodling apps. Um, and I can take a picture and then I can like write in the answer, but, um, we have found more advanced things that, um, I'll be showing in a minute, um, instead of that. And then I have another app, which I have on my iPod here as well, um, and it is called Vision Assist. So, what I can do is I can magnify this up to... 20 times right there and I can minimize it down to two times whereas it's slightly smaller on this it goes down to one time um, so this is really helpful also if you go into the settings on here I've already done it but if you go into the settings you can scroll through here and this one of the settings that I did was if I tap the screen it will take off the control. Um, some of the really helpful features that we have on here is I have one thing, um, I actually have two of them, but one I prefer more than the other. I have this app called read to go so oh, yeah. I have a hard time reading <laughs> books with fairly small... It's repeating him. Yeah, sorry, I think... No, sorry. no, it's okay. <laughs> oh, text. So, um... I have this, I and it really, really. I'm not able to forward it. Sorry, Anna Maria. No, it's okay. Don't worry about it. I think they get the gist of it. So great video. Sorry, I'll move on to the next slide. Yeah. Sure. Yep. Really. Okay. So some of the applications on this left column here um, that are common in the on the iPad are. Um, many of the TVIs download for the parent, the child and the parent is the Peekaboo Barn, cause and effect, light box, uh, fluidity, uh, fireworks is self-explanatory. It's like if they, they have fireworks. So, and then tap and see is the one with the black background and the red teddy bear that s starts up small and then it gets bigger and then moves around the screen. But the left side of the screen, many of the children with cortical vision impairment or infants and toddlers, they use that type of applications. And then on the right side here <clears throat> um, is the, the app similar to what um, the patient before was explaining, like the vision assist, KFNB reader, reads the text out loud to you. Notability, what's great about it is that the patient can um, get the the materials and then download it. And then what they do is they can write on the, let's say a handout that the teacher provided was um, electronically sent to her. She can write on it and then save it, enlarge the text and then write on it and then save it <clears throat> and then can send it back to the teacher um, with, with the saved in a smaller font, like in the normal font presentation. Um, and then Epic and Learning Ally are like reading material apps that are very helpful for the children. read to go is another common app that they have so they can download books that can read. But this is ever changing. There's always new, new apps. So um, there's a great resource that you can check. It's called wonderbaby.org um, or the Perkins School for the Blind website that can um, show you what apps are, are really helpful for these children. Next. <clears throat> um, so often we get referrals for, um, from the Augmentative Communication Department because many kids have communication devices such as the Dynavox, the Toby, Touch to Chat, and sometimes they start um, developing these tools for these children, but then they're not really aware of that some of the vision, vision uh, impairments that they have. So often when they come in, we do an assessment to see, especially for the Toby, if they're able to um, track and uh, make choices with uh, gaze, eye gaze. Um, we check to see if it's both eyes can be calibrated or one eye. We look to see, um, we look at the salient features of the Mayor Johnson symbols, 
Uh, we look to see if there's too many on a page. As you can see here, if this is a child with cortical vision impairment that's starting to learn how to use um, this communication device, maybe perhaps we would recommend using um, less symbols on a page and then work their way up slowly. Um, but these are some of the things that we do. It takes time to do these assessments. Um, often we recommend the parent to bring in the device, we set it up, and we look to see how they use it in the um, exam room. Next. Um, so this is another, another uh, sample of the uh, Mayor Johnson symbols overlays. So once again, we look at we look at the, the symbols, we look to see um, like if the features are of the, sa the salient features of the symbols are too small or if there's poor contrast. Um, so often we recommend sometimes like a back black background to provide better contrast. Uh, the borders help also to, um, to provide a, a visual guide and also these are guards to assist with um, when they're trying to make its choice and touch the symbol to prevent from, like to make a more visual guided choice. So, and next, <clears throat> often we also discuss about uh, keyboard modifications. Like there's many keyboards with enlarged letters or uh, large or braille keys. Um, next, <clears throat> also we discuss um, the option of braille. Braille is another uh, great tool for many children with low vision because um, because of the the level of low vision, their reading fluency is slowed down. But braille provides an opportunity to improve with reading speed. Um, but also during the assess the assessment, you have to be aware about if the ch the um, child if they're able to tactically tactically. Um, perform braille because they, um, the TVI has to see if, if they're, you know, if they're able to touch the, the braille symbols and then also process the information. So most of the TVIs perform like a sensory channels assessment to see if they're a good candidate for um, <clears throat> braille. Next, <clears throat> large print materials. So um, self-explanatory, you can order books from the APH. Um, with enlarged font, um, games with enlarged print. We talk about modifications of new, newspapers, maps, atlas. Um, <clears throat> next. Um, normally we select print size based on how they perform on their near acuity testing. Um, so we start uh, with like at least one or two, two lines above their threshold acuity. Um, and normally the standard size print for a reading material for the first grader is 24, but if they need to be larger, we would recommend twice the size at least. <clears throat> Next. Um, the large print available is pre-printed textbooks would be best for these um, children with low vision. Um, also, when we uh, recommend if the teachers are photocopying the materials and enlarging it, with the photocopy, we have to um, inform the teachers and the parents to be aware of, like if you are photocopying, to be aware about the contrast of the materials and make sure like the pictures and charts are not left out. Um, um, and then, <laughs> uh, let's see. Okay, you can go on to the next one. Sorry, Parna. <clears throat> next, please, yeah. Um, also, another approach to uh, children with low vision is uh, auditory approach to learning. So there's many books on tape. Um, you know, often they can record the classes so that they can um, listen, you know, listen to it later in the day or at home. <clears throat> and also there's computer and software that does speech output, output such as the Kurzweil, KFNB Reader, um, and Zoom Text. And then there's um, a live readers next <laughs> and then I'm handing it off to Dr. Miller again so so and another aspect that we look at uh, in doing in developing accommodations for a child there are things that are non-optical most of the things we've been just discussing so far have been optical base uh, but there are many recommendations you can make that are simple uh, that that seem to be common sense but they're really good to put down on a on your, in your report to make it clear that these adaptations can be beneficial. 
Um, certainly sunglasses or any type of a, a tint um, may be appropriate for some of your patients. Uh, certainly uh, individuals with albinism or achromatopsia are gonna need some type of uh, tinted lenses. Um, many of our children do so much better if you give them bold line paper. So that, that's writing paper that just has dark black lines. Um, this can be obtained on the computer, uh, made up on the computer, but they are also commercially available if you, if you prefer to purchase them. But it gives the child a little added contrast and able to be able to see the, the line a little bit better. So they're a little bit neater when they write, they can stay within the lines. And also using some type of a writing instrument that gives them a little darker contrast can be beneficial, like a felt tip pen, or if they need to erase, I very often uh, recommend some of the artist pencils, which can, you can get a darker lead color and, and that will increase your contrast a little bit. <clears throat> the light sensitivity, obviously outdoors, a hat with a visor is helpful. Uh, and even indoors, a visor can be beneficial for kids uh, to prevent the overhead lights, which may be uh, too bright for them based on their diagnosis. Uh, line guides such as a, a typoscope, which I'll show you in a slide in a minute. A, a typoscope is, uh, just isolates one or two lines of print at a time, but it allows the child to really focus on that print and not be distracted by the uh, other detail that may be available on the page or viewable on the page. Uh, we look at placement of materials. You know, think about the child's field cut. If they have a specific field cut, say inferiorly, you don't want to put all of your material in the inferior field. You probably want to push it up just a little bit uh, more to the central or, or a slightly uh, in superior field to, to have them view it more appropriately. And the use of slant boards can help with this. A slant board, obviously you just set reading material uh, on the board. You can adjust it to close distances if they need to view at a close range um, or move the material up and down as is necessary. And this does cut down on fatigue, physical fatigue, uh, because uh, most of your kids, I, I think you'll see if because they adopt such close viewing distance, they are often hunched over on their desks. They hold their, you know, if they're writing, they're one or two inches away from the paper with their head down on the desk trying to write. So, um, uh, and, and read. So the slant board can be beneficial in that sense. Um, a big, a big uh, plus is trying to get the teachers uh, to give them hard copies of whatever's presented in the classroom. So if they have an overhead projection, a hard copy of that material at their desk is helpful. A hard copy of anything on the blackboard or the whiteboard is helpful. Uh, and that way the child can move the materials closer as they need it. And certainly they're going to need extra time. Anything they do, whether it's reading, taking a test, uh, particularly standardized tests, they're going to need um, extended time uh, to complete this. These recommendations, by the way, should be written into their report because a, a lot of times the schools do not feel obligated to, uh, mm -hmm. to provide these recommendations unless they're listed. So it's important to list them as, as accommodations in our formal report. Next slide. So I mentioned a little bit about tinted lenses and um, the, the two groups that are most likely to use these, as I mentioned, are, is uh, cases of albinism or achromatopsia. Uh, the top picture shows a, a baby with dark tinted glasses and the, the style of the frame is important. Um, you've got sort of thick temple areas um, and you have a thicker frame that kind of hugs the face and wraps around the face. And this blocks a lot more light than your standard sunglass. So the design of the sunglasses is, is important to help block light. Uh, the tint, we very often select based on a trial. I will have different, I have different tinted sunglasses uh, in the office and we literally take a walk outside and put one on after the other and try, you know, the gray tints, the brown tints, whatever 
um, the reddish tints, whatever it may be um, most appropriate for the patient. But we give them a chance to make some selection, obviously, because they're the ones who can tell you the best what, uh, what works for them. The lower picture is a tinted contact lens. And this is something I do quite frequently. I use tinted contact lenses as a means of decreasing photophobia, <clears throat> not only indoors, which is important, but also for outdoor use. Um, this is extremely helpful in cases of uh, achromatopsia. Most of your cases of achromatopsia with severe photophobia come into your office and you'll see them squinting and they're, you know, they've got their eyes pretty scrunched up and they obviously look light sensitive indoors. Um, most of them will wear, you know, dark tinted or red tinted glasses indoors on a constant basis. And fitting them with a contact lens, you'll see an immediate response to this, um, uh, to the contact. They stop squinting, you know, from a cosmetic standpoint, it looks great because they don't have to wear sunglasses or red tinted glasses indoors. Uh, and cosmetically, the contact lenses tend to make the eyes look dark brown um, it, the, based on the, the tint level you select. Uh, and that's okay, you know, because it's, they're not forced to wear their sunglasses indoors anymore. Um, and uh, it cuts down uh, significantly on the light sensitivity. I also find it's helpful outdoors when they use a tinted sun, uh, tinted contact lens in conjunction with maybe a medium uh, tint pair of sunglasses for outdoor use. And that tends to block a little bit more light than uh, they typically get from the sunglass alone. So don't be afraid to use contact lenses. <laughs> Uh, next slide. So I did mention these already, the, the type of scope, which isolates one or two lines of print. Uh, and here's an example of bold line paper for writing uh, that helps to enhance the contrast for uh, better writing efficiency. Uh, now, um, part of our assessment, particularly for a child who has, is just coming to us for the first time, is to make sure that they're hooked up with the services outside of the home uh, or in the school that, that will help them to succeed um, from the standpoint of uh, classroom work. So this is really critical to make sure that they have, they are connected with the teachers of the visually impaired uh, to have an assessment uh, so that whatever services are deemed needed can be put into place. And in, in Massachusetts, at least, we have preschool services that uh, we can uh, have the teachers of the visually impaired come into the home setting and they provide their sessions directly in the home. Um, maybe every two to four weeks, they, they, they dictate what level of services are provided. But they do assess the, the development of the child, um, both um, academically as well as visually. And they develop a program for them to try to develop visual skills, promote the use of their vision. Uh, and they're a great resource for parents uh, from the standpoint of uh, getting uh, information about, uh, about the child's vision disorder. Next slide. So uh, obviously the, in the school setting, the teachers of the visually impaired uh, come into the classroom and here they help the classroom teacher develop the appropriate academic strategies that uh, might be needed for the child to succeed in the classroom. And, you know, obviously their goal is to ensure independence for the child, that they want to provide them with the, the optical devices they need, the vision technology, and they're right there so they can implement whatever alterations in the classroom environment are necessary. Next slide. So um, for, for children who have uh, mobility disorders, and uh, most of them eventually will have an assessment by an orientation and mobility instructor, uh, the goal here is to, to, to enhance their safety when they travel. Uh, these services are provided in the school setting, and they include um, learning to use a cane, 
uh, learning bus, trains, uh, even airplanes, how to, how to access them and, and travel independently. Uh, we have a lot of children in wheelchairs and they work with uh, children to make them better aware of their environment, how to move, particularly if they have electronic wheelchairs, you know, how to judge curbs um, and make, um, make assessments while they're maneuvering in, in the environment, particularly if the environment is unfamiliar. And they're very critical to developing independence with children. So uh, it's important to connect uh, the, the patients with the orientation and mobility specialists. Next slide. So I, I wanted to just run through a, a case with you just so you could get the idea of uh, putting everything together, how a, a child would use the devices uh, and what types of uh, issues they run into. So um, this was a, a boy who presented to our clinic at the age of five years and he presented having failed a vision screening uh, uh, through his school. Uh, he came in, he had a complete assessment, uh, his vision was around 20-30 in each eye, he had absolutely no retinal findings, there was no sign of any type of pathology. Um, so uh, he was sent home, you know, recommended coming back in a year or two for a routine eye exam and there was no concern with any a pathology at that time. He returned to the clinic at the age of eight uh, because he was complaining about distance blur. Uh, his vision at that time was best corrected uh, to 2070. And as you can see in these pictures, he started to develop uh, very irregular pigmentary changes in the macula. Um, he was uh, subsequently put through um, all of our extensive uh, retinal evaluations uh, to assess his condition and also through genetic testing. And it was determined that he had Stargott's disease, which was genetically confirmed. Next slide. Um, visual fields also showed a central uh, scotoma in each eye, uh, which was significant. And uh, one of his complaints was uh, regarding uh, mobility. And uh, he did uh, feel that there were some concerns with stairs and uh, independence and safety in general. Next slide. So um, when he initially presented, these were the concerns that he presented with. And as Anna Maria said, we very often look at the initial concerns because what we recommend is based on what the, con the concerns and the complaints are. So um, we like to go, you know, make a laundry list of the, the concerns and then try to address each one of them. Um, the a, a concern, it was really a concern more of the parent than the child, was independence and safety with travel because I think she was aware that he didn't pick up the ability, wasn't able to see things at distance quite as well, tripped over curbs, that type of thing. Um, the child himself complained, obviously, of blurred distance vision. Uh, he also had issues with reading, and the, the issues with reading were more related to visual fatigue, um, and he found himself pulling reading materials close to him in the four to six inch uh, range for best viewing. He also, at the age of eight, was starting to slip behind his peers in regards to maintaining his grade level. So he was one grade level behind in reading, um, and his primary concern was that the textbook print was just too small. Uh, the classroom teachers also noticed a significant decrease in his attention in the classroom and part of that may just be that he was having difficulty seeing so uh, certainly wasn't uh, able to attend as expected. Next slide. So um, we followed him from the age of eight and he's now 14 and um, uh, over the years, we, we've seen a, a general uh, decrease in his distance visual acuity. Uh, he's now at the level of 2150 in each eye, right eye, left eye, and 2125 both eyes. Uh, he has a slight correction for hyperopic astigmatism, which he does find uh, beneficial. Um, his near acuity, we, is uh, in a comparable range to his distance acuity in the 21-25 range. 
Um, and obviously, if we allow him to pull the material to a little closer distance, that increases the uh, retinal image size, so he does see better uh, into the 2050 range. Next slide. So the recommendations that we uh, that he has in place currently uh, relate to uh, orientation and mobility, and he is learning to use a cane. Um, he has obviously learned sighted guide. Now, he's an individual who has a maculopathy and his peripheral field is pretty good. In other words, he, he doesn't have issues with peripheral vision, it's primarily central. But um, it's good to learn these techniques and to go through the process of being trained with orientation and mobility because they teach you, you know, the ability to scan, um, they teach you about safety with travel. Uh, so the kids become much more astute travelers if they've been trained. Uh, the other issue is the cane, whether or not he uses it now, is, is useful for identification, for other people to know that he is visually impaired and they need to be aware of that. So it's more from a safety standpoint to identify that he has a vision disorder. Next slide. Um, he uses a lot of technology. Uh, most of his uh, work is done on a MacBook for typing. Uh, he has a DaVinci video magnifier that he uses at home uh, and an Onyx video magnifier that he uses at school. Uh, these both have a camera uh, attachment to allow distance and near viewing. Uh, so he's, he's got quite a bit of technology in the classroom. He finds it very helpful. Uh, and it's uh, helping him get through his studies. Next slide. So the, the one thing I wanna stress is that, um, is the use of a bifocal. This is one person who you would think a bifocal may not have a big, um, may not be a big benefit to him, but this was the one thing he always said when he would come in for his visits is, I really like my bifocal. Since I got my bifocal, I really can see pretty well. And I think it just allows him to hold his viewing material closer um, without being as visually fatigued. And I think it's all about fatigue and the ability to hold materials at a close range. So I would never hesitate to give a child a bifocal lens just from, for that factor. Um, his visual acuity at this point, although um, not quite 2200, certainly was in the range uh, that we did register him with the Commission for the Blind, uh, primarily so that he could begin as he starts looking forward to high school to get the services that he needs going forward. Um, so we hooked him up a, a little bit early, but uh, based on his acuity measures, um, he's, he's pretty close. Next slide, please. So these are additional low vision accommodations that he truly enjoyed using. Um, he uses a 6X telescope and he, it, this provides him vision of 2025. He uses this primarily for mobility purposes. Now, you wouldn't think that somebody with a maculopathy, if you put them behind a telescope, that they would, they would be able to use it effectively. But in his particular case, he, it worked beautifully and uh, he uses it on a regular basis. So I guess what I'm saying is don't be, don't be afraid to try a device, even if you think it's not gonna work. I think it deserves trial and then make a determination, yes, it works, no, it doesn't. Uh, the other device he, he did truly like to use was a dome magnifier because he could take this with him. He could stick it in his pocket, take it with him. It was a great portable reading device, uh, and um, he's someone who uses it regularly. And the other accommodations are typical um, extended time for testing, preferential seating in the classroom, and uh, high contrast um, academic materials. So in other words, you know, any copies of materials he gets in the classroom should be clean copies. So, uh, so you're maximizing uh, his ability to view them. Next slide. So this is a device that we decided to try with him. Um, it, it's 
It's called the OR cam. And uh, for those that may not be familiar with it, it, if you look at the glasses there, there's a camera attached to the side of the frame. The camera will in real time take a picture of whatever it is you're looking at. And the way you use it is you actually take your finger and point to a reading material or point to a can or a, or a, a box of, if you wanna make macaroni and cheese or something. And it will uh, take a photograph and it will begin to read the text to you. So um, it's, a, it's a great device to have available uh, when you're moving around and you need to go from place to place and you need to have something quick that can read, uh, read back to you. Uh, it also helps, obviously, in reducing visual fatigue. And the reason we use, we tried this device was not so much that we felt he needed it because I, at this time, because I think he's been doing well with the devices that we talked about previously. But his sister has a similar condition and her visual acuity is uh, significantly worse than his, more in the 2400 range. And she had started to use one of these um, and it made a huge difference in her life. So, um, so not to overlook this, we did send him out for an assessment just recently to look into obtaining uh, an mm -hmm. OR cam or if he would be an appropriate candidate for that. Um, but it's, an, it's another device I've begun to use with some of the kids that have more significant vision uh, loss who do not take well to some of these other devices that we've been talking about and need more of an auditory uh, readback uh, uh, device than a visual device. Next slide. And I'll hand this one over to Anna Maria. So this case is about a, a child with um, albinism and how we approach a low vision exam for a child with albinism. <clears throat> Next slide. So the ocular characteristics are like um, the iris transillumination defects, nystagmus, a hypopigmented um, fundus, uh, foveal hypoplasia. Uh, often they have uh, variable refractive of errors, high astigmatisms, myopia, hyperopia, um, lack, of a st lack of a stereopsis and strabismus. And the visual acuities for a child with albinism or an adult can vary from like 2025 to 2400. Next slide. <clears throat> um, so this is an eight-year-old that comes in. She's entering third grade and uh, she has oculocutaneous albinism. Um, her diagnosis is she has foveal hypoplasia, nystagmus, and hyperopia with astigmatism. Um, they wanted to know if the glasses would really help with, um, with reading and what accommodations are needed in the classroom. So that was the primary concern for the, for the exam. Um, entrance exam uh, findings, visual cuties were 20 over 125 for each eye and both eyes open. Near cuties were um, the same, 20 over 125, uh, using the Lighthouse Near Cutie chart. Um, so often we do like a trial frame refraction. I hardly ever use the Feropter to do a refraction on a child with low vision. I mainly use trial frames. So as you can see, there's a significant amount of, of astigmatism and myopia in this child. So um, even though it doesn't correct the visual acuities to an improvement, but it may provide some like clarity, a little clarity at least. And then also what's important is like, for instance, a child that has, let's say if she was a little younger and let's say her visual acuity was, um, there was a difference and there was like some amblyopia present, often we would still try to patch because we wanna to try to provide these patients the best visual potential um, as possible. Next. Um, recommendations. So we, we provide the prescription. She appreciated a plus four ad as well and improved her, uh, her acuities were 0 0.8 M. Um, also for children with albinism, they have to have sunglasses, a hat for outdoors because they're extremely photophobic. Um, often I have to write additional letters for the parents so that they're able to get 
uh, sunglasses or to transition transition lenses approved by their insurances. Um, so that's an additional uh, requirement during our low vision evaluation. Um, she appreciated like a 2x bright field magnifier for reading when we trialed it during the low vision evaluation. Uh, we also trialed like a 4x12 telescope for distance viewing and she was able to improve to 2020. Um, like Dr. Miller um, mentioned before, the telescopic device, like often these children with a nystagmus, they may need additional training on how to use it. But for the, in this case, it was a helpful uh, tool. Um, <clears throat> often the orientation mobility uh, instructor assists with learning how to use this device, particularly when they're walking around um, in their neighborhood so they can look at signs and look at um, the bus numbers if they're learning to take the bus route. Um, <clears throat> and also we did uh, a technology, recommended a technology assessment to determine um, if the need for a CCTV or um, any other computer devices at home. Many of the children too now use the iPad as well. Um, additional uh, recommendations, extended time is really important. Um, a lot of kids feel that they can't complete the entire workload um, in a timely manner. Um, they fatigue very easily, so they need frequent breaks. It's so important. I think a lot of the teachers are not aware of that, um, so we have to include this in our, um, in our list of recommendations. Um, we often recommend enlarged font, and often we provide an enclosed copy of what the recommended size font, but this may vary. Um, at times, like the TVI may also retest this in, in the school setting. <clears throat> we often uh, include orientation mobility um, evaluation, especially if there's concerns with uh, safety um, in unfamiliar and familiar environments. Um, also, we recommend as the child transitions from one school to the next um, to have a orientation um, or an evaluation pro orientation prior to school starting, like a couple of weeks, so that they can be become familiar with the new school. Um, we put that in our assessment and plan as well. Preferential seating. Um, and then also we, we include rec uh, continued services by a vision specialist. Um, next slide. So, Dr. Miller, do you want to go over the tinted lenses or do you all right, I'll do it. I think um, we we weren't going to go over that part, but okay, all right, well, that's a, yeah. I think. I mean, so, I think right? that's the same picture I use. These are the ones we put yeah. at the end. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right, so I think we're all. You know, thank you for uh, allowing us this opportunity. Um, so I think we're all set. Yeah, it's been great to to talk to everybody. And if you have any questions or uh, or need uh, re information from us, to feel free to contact us. We'd be more than happy to help out. This is fantastic. Dr. Milagram was just text was chatting on the side telling me how complete this presentation. We've had many of these webinar series over the last, from the time of the COVID, and definitely this is one of the most detailed uh, sessions that we've had. So it is certainly a, a resource for us, and I'm sure many will listen to it later on, and it's mm -hmm. extremely detailed. <clears throat> we've had a couple yes. of um, low vision providers give us talks and this is uniquely different. So thank you so much. I really knew thank that you. <laughs> talk would make an impact. Uh, so I'm so yeah. glad you guys got the time and I know how busy we are in clinics and clinics have started. So um, thank you so much really for your time. I'm just looking for questions. I think a, a couple of them might have just left early because I think they all have clinics and everything. Sure, but, yeah. Uh, I think, uh, let me see if there are any questions there. Yeah, no, I second what Aparna said. I think I really enjoyed it because it was very comprehensive and complete. And this is actually going to be a valuable training resource for years, uh, you know, on our training academy, which is used by eye care professionals. So thank you so much for taking time to deliver such a detailed, complete lecture. In fact, uh, I was having a chat with Lubaina, who's on our board. She's an occupational therapist, and she says that they've covered everything. So I almost have no questions. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> you know, and what I really want to say, this is Lubaina. Uh, you know, I work in the public schools. Uh, so I deal with, you know, school age children uh, with, you know, low vision uh, challenges. And what I really liked about your presentation is that you covered the non-optical interventions. Yes. Uh, yeah. Things that mm -hmm. I would suggest, you know, so I really like that comprehensive approach. And we have a lot of children who come into your clinic, you know, and come back with evaluations. And I think those are also just as valuable as the more technical uh, uh, remediation that you suggest. So I would just, you know, word of encouragement that please keep doing that because that's important uh, to present to school administration you know, when we try to get accommodations in place for these students, uh, which is, you know, seems so simple, but sometimes can be a battle. I think we look at our accommodations as supporting what you do in the classroom. And the idea is if we don't recommend it, then the school doesn't think it's important. So it's more to back up some of the recommendations that you may have already put together in the classroom, but listing them is important. And I think they come from a different source and that says, yes, they also need, you know, preferential seating or bold line paper, then they'll, they're more likely to have that incorporated into the IEP. So you're absolutely right. I think our role is to support what you do and to help you get the tools that you need to do the job in the classroom. Thank you. I have a quick question. Um, you know, and it's really, it's really more a sensory visual question. That often, you know, you know, I deal a lot with children with sensory processing difficulties as an OT, and uh, I highly recommend the fluorescent light covers uh, for these children in the classroom. You know, mm -hmm. the blue, the yellows, and you know, we sometimes, in a, and it's a personal preference. Some teachers prefer yellow, some teachers prefer white, some teachers prefer blue. You know, based on their experience that they find has a very calming influence for the class in general. Do you have an opinion on, on this accommodation? Uh, or so are you familiar have, with it? I'm, 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 I have many children who complain about lighting in the classroom, um, most of which is fluorescent lighting. And what I usually recommend, I'm not so familiar with the covers that go over the fluorescence, but um, I usually recommend that they replace the bulbs with a natural uh, natural light bulb, rather, not bulb, but, you know, fl uh, rod, uh, rather right. than the fluorescence, because they're much more comfortable to the eye. So if you can get, um, get the school system to change over the classroom, that's somewhat helpful, too. Okay. I don't know much about the covers. Do you, Anna Maria, have you run into that? Um, no, I just... I know about the fluorescent lighting and often I do the test like if the child I have them do this and if they feel that they're more comfortable when they do this then maybe I recommend trying to do adjustments to the lighting in the classroom but right. no I don't really have experience with with changing the covers of the light um the light fixtures to red so or yellow we yeah. have uh, it's it's much easier to get the covers because good old amazon supplies them yeah, uh, yeah. but uh you know, so when we are outdoors, so this is for kids who sensory wise get overstimulated with bright light, mm -hmm. which is where these uh, covers help. And then outdoors, we use the visor. You okay. Know, caps with visors. So, or sunglasses. Yeah, that's interesting because I think I went to a lecture not too long ago and they were saying the color pink, they illuminated the room, the color pink to soothe the prisoners. <laughs> so um so yeah i'm not surprised that maybe like certain colors for the kids with sensory may right benefit from it but i don't have a lot of experience with them sorry oh. no that's all right it's just curious mm -hmm. Man has a question i'm gonna un unmute you uh ram i'm not able to unmute him okay actually i'm going to uh allow zoom to, in fact, allow all participants to unmute themselves if they want. And so please do this. There is one more question from the provide, like from the listener. Yeah, at uh, this point. About how extra measures, what extra measures will you take for patients who are assessing with a nystagmus and how do you measure interpupillary distance? Uh, 
You want to take that, Anna Marie, or you want me to try? Uh, with a pupillary distance? How do you, what, so, what extra measures you take for uh, assessing a assessing patient? Nystagmus. And... So, obviously, nystagmus, you want to know if there's a null point. The null mm -hmm. point is critical when you're evaluating visual acuity, when you're assessing print size, because the null point is the point where the nystagmus slows. Uh, and as the nystagmus slows down, the visual acuity will improve. So you want to know where that position is in space. Most of the children who come in with nystagmus, if they have a significant null point, will keep their head, we didn't yeah. mention much of this today, but they'll keep their head turned into a particular posture to make use of that null point. So the last thing you want is somebody trying to straighten their head out. That's not what you do. And I think a lot of teachers in the classroom or a lot of parents will say, well, why do they have their head turned? I want the head to be straight. Um, I usually say, let them turn their head. And if the head turn is significant, that it's impairing them. So in other words, if they, they really have an extreme right head turn or extreme left head turn, um, we do send them to our surgeons to try to manipulate the uh, alignment of the eyes to try to shift the null point so that it's now in the central field rather than somewhere else. So it realigns the position of the null point. Um, I haven't tried much with PRISM. I know in the, in the past I have used PRISM to try to realign eyes left, realign eyes right, up or down, based on a null point. In the times that I've done it, I have found a change in their head position um, for a while, but you need an, a lot of PRISM to be able to get the eyes to shift. And the amount of PRISM you need makes a here, I'm always talking about cosmetics of what things look like, but the, the prismatic lenses can get pretty thick on one edge if, uh, if you're using it to shift their vision left or right. So um, most of them, although their head posture improved, their willingness to wear the glasses was not, uh, was not there. So it, you know, it ended up not being uh, effective, but it, that's a possibility is to use some type of a prismatic shift. Now, there was another part of that question, um, the, the pupillary the, measurement. The pupil. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, I would try to just have them, you know, do the, like what the opticians do, like try to take the measurement that way. That's, that's my experience. But um, I think it's, I would have to, you know, what I can do is I can ask our optician, Chandra, and see what, how she approaches it just to help help you guys out a little but yeah I, haven't... I would just eyeball the center of the pupil place your yeah. place your ruler there and you know you yeah like using a light reflex where it ends up and you mm -hmm. just gotta wait and watch a little bit to make sure you're relatively in the center it's not going to be the most accurate measure and i don't know if i mean chandra might be able to give you some clues if you know some of the pupilometers will work but i i suspect maybe not yeah um, i don't yeah, she probably does it with a ruler and then maybe a light reflex, but I can verify that for you. <clears throat> question. Yeah. Okay. Did I ask? Yes, please. Okay. My question is that these children, when they are getting ready for college, do these test scores allowance is given to them for admission for example for a regular child if they want if they expect 700 will they accept this child with 500 score i mean do they give some allowance to a, a impaired child to get admission to the same college my impression is that most colleges are very accepting of children with disabilities and they are very willing to um, accept a child who has been successful um, without having the same type of scores. So I, that's my impression. Um, I'm not obviously on the board of uh, admissions, but I have seen colleges do tremendous things to make the child, the they're not children at that point, I guess, make the um, young adults able to succeed in their college program. 
um, by giving them whatever supports they need. And also for the testing, like the SAT and the, um, uh, the ACT testing for college boards, they do give them adjustments to taking the test, meaning they'll give them extra time. Usually it's time and a half. Uh, and they will allow them, if they need um, a device to enlarge the print, um, they will allow them to, um, to get the larger print as well if they prefer a large print version of the test. And I think, have they allowed them to use the computers yet, Anna Maria, to enlarge? Some, um, but maybe a, a scribe sometimes they have a... Yeah, they could have somebody read record the answers for them so that they don't yeah. have to worry about filling out a sheet. Yeah. Yeah. Um, a lot of these things are being switched electronically, so I think that that's going to become a, less of an issue because you'll have the ability to adjust the print size. And, um, but they will give them the extra time, make the adjustments for the test itself. And I think there's a lot of schools now that don't force you to take the um, college board tests that you can apply without them and use just your school record as your basis for um, going into a into college so some of the some of the colleges will uh, accept your application without those tests and be more flexible with them Good yes. thing. thank you thank you very much thank you're welcome thank you Puranjay. Thank you, Anna Maria. And Thank Dr. you. Dr. Miller for You're your You're very time. welcome. It was a pleasure. It was a pleasure, yeah. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Miller, Dr. Anna Maria. It thank you. Fantastic talk. Really appreciate it. And thank You're you very all for welcome. coming. Great talk. Thank you. And have a nice day. And good yeah, have a good day. In India. Okay. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank Bye. you so much.